You are welcome to Day Tooth Academy where we are devoted to building excellence in students, especially when it comes to the STEM subject. Our video today is going to be the physics exam prep as we are going to be looking at one of the past questions from WAEC, particularly the 2021 WAEC exam. And we are going to look at all the 12 questions that are featured in the theory paper. We are going to be solving them, explaining the concept behind this question in a bit to prepare you for excellence that when you are facing any physics exam that is actually related to this, talk about WAEC, GCE, NECO, GCSE, GED, and even the basis of JAMBUTME, then you are going to find this very, very useful and it will set you on your path to excellence. Our work is so much cut out for us, but before we just go, we will appreciate that you actually leave your feedback in the comment section so that we can know where we can actually improve on the videos that we are doing that can help you to gain that excellence. And if there is anything that you are not clear upon, just leave the question also in the comment section. We attend to all of our comments and then don't forget to like the video so that you can improve our algorithm to also make this available for students out there that will be needing them. And if you are here to subscribe, go ahead and click the subscription icon and you will have feeds of all of our videos once we upload them. So if you want more videos like this that will help you to build excellence in your academics, you can just check our playlist on mathematics, on physics, even on chemistry and you will see a whole lot of videos that have been treated both on past questions and even on the explanation of fundamental concepts. This holistically can help you to set you on that path of excellence and build a better future that we are looking for. So our work is cut out for us. Let's just go ahead and head over to our video for today. In this question, we are told that the load extension graph, so this is load, okay, on the vertical axis and on the horizontal axis, this is the extension. But before we go ahead, let's just look at the unit that we are being given. Load is given in newtons and extension is being given in centimeters. So for us not to make any mistake, we need to just know that so that if we want to use the appropriate unit, we should convert as appropriate, okay? Now, that's quite interesting that we are being asked to find the work done on stretching the material. Normally, in mechanics, we know that work is a product of force times distance, okay? But in this particular case, we are looking at a graph in which at the initial starting point, the load, which is the force being exerted, is actually zero. And the extension, of course, since the load is zero, the extension is also zero. But as a reason of the fact that the load is being increased, the extension that is also produced is being increased. And that is why we have this. The shaded region is the graph that corresponds to that. Because ideally, if you just want to use the product of force and this, I can say four times one, and that is four. No, that will not be right. Okay. In this case, originally it started from zero. So for the solution to this question, that work will be the area under the graph area under the graph is going to give us the work done for this particular load extension graph that we are giving and that will be given as look at this this is nothing but a triangle so it is half multiplied by the base multiplied by the height or looking at what we are having here we are losing load in newtons and extension so we are going to have f multiplied by e but again what is our f we can now go ahead to try and solve this that f as we have been given on the peak it is four and that is four newtons but the extension look at this the extension that we have is one centimeters and you know that in using the standard unit you, you cannot use centimeter you need to convert to meters so that is nothing but one times 10 raised to power minus two meters okay it's just as if you are dividing as one over hundred and that will now be in meters but i want to write it just as 1 times 10 raised to the power minus 2, such that we can find the work done in this particular case as 1 over 2 force times extension. And if you want to evaluate that, that will be 1 over 2 multiplied by the force, that is 4 newtons, okay, multiplied by the extension, that is 1 times 10 raised to the power minus 2 meters. So these two can cut this 4, so we have to, so that the work done will now be given as 2 times 10 raised to the power minus 2, and what is the unit of work that will be joules? That's the new things multiplied by the meters, that will be joules, and this is going to be the solution for this question. Here, we are asked to name two artificial satellites, and we are also being given that a geostationary satellite moves in an orbit of radius 6,300 kilometers, and to find the speed with which it moves in the orbit very good and fine in the first case 
You just need to know these artificial satellites so that you'll be able to answer this. And some of them are just as listed there. You have Sputnik, GPS, Mr. Goals. And since we are just asked to name two, any two will survive. Okay. Now, in this second question, we have been told that the geostationary satellite moves in an orbit of radius 6,300 kilometers. So if you want to depict that radius, this is the heart and this is the satellite. We have that radius that we are giving there, okay, as distance from the center of the heart to the satellite. And the parameters that we are giving, if you want to make use of them, you have R to be 6,300 kilometers, but speed is gotten in meters per second. So you can say this is nothing but 6,300 kilo means multiplied by 10 raised to the power 3 meters, okay? We have been given pi to be 22 over 7, pi is 22 over 7, but if you have a good understanding of geostationary satellite, what it implies is that it's circling that orbit within 24 hours. So the time that we are looking at in this place is 24 hours. But again, since we are working with respect to meter per second, as what is going to be our unit, we need to multiply 24, multiply by 60, that will be in minutes. Then again, multiply by 60, that will be in seconds. So speed which we know to be distance over time we cannot get here but in this particular case what's going to be the distance that this satellite will cover in moving around here that's going to be defined by the circumference of the orbit and circumference is nothing but 2 pi r over t so this is what we need to input into our calculator that that velocity is 2 pi is 22 over 7 R, we have gotten to be 6,300 multiplied by 10 raised to the power 3. And then the time, we have gotten to be 24 times 60 multiplied by 60. So we can say it is meters over seconds. So we just need to put all of this into our calculator to get the value of the velocity as appropriate. And we'll do that just now. Now we have 2 times, okay, let me just put everything in bracket first. The numerator, 2 times 22 over 7, okay, then multiply by 6,300, then multiply by 10 raised to power 3, that's the numerator, so the denominator now divided by 24 times 60 times 60, okay, so what's that going to give us? 1375 over 3, but in decimal, 458.3. You know, this bar means that it is a repetitive theory. So you can just say 458.3. So this is 458.3 meters per second. And with this, you've been able to answer this question holistically as expected of us. In this question on projectors, we are told that a projectile is fired at an angle of 30 degrees to the horizontal with a velocity of 40 meters per second. We are to calculate the velocity attained after one second, and we can take the acceleration due to gravity, g, to be 10 meters per second squared. So this is a pictorial view of what we have that, yes, at an angle of 30 degrees, the projectile is being fired, okay? And then its initial velocity of launch is 40 meters per second. Since it is a projectile, and if we really understand our resolution, of components we will know that since 30 degrees is to the horizontal then the horizontal component of the velocity will be 40 cos 30 while for the vertical component we need to be careful to get this okay let me just say it like this that eventually we are going to have it that our u that we are looking for is going to be the square root of u s square plus u y square Okay, so that's what is going to give us the velocity after one second in this particular time. But recollect, we are giving g to be 10 meter per second and the time of concentration to be one second. So, what is going to be our vertical component of that velocity? For that, we are going to recall that normally v is u plus 80. And why are we bringing u plus 80 here? Because... For the vertical component in moving upward, acceleration due to gravity is going to act on that body, okay? So, the fact that acceleration due to gravity is acting on that body, we mean that 
there will be a pool. So this A will actually be minus. So in that case, we can say that our UI is going to be nothing but the original component on the horizontal, which is 40 sine 30. But now, because it is a vertical component, we need to subtract 10, which is acceleration due to gravity, multiplied by the time, which is 1. Okay, so this is what we are supposed to make use of. And if you bring in our calculator, we can find ux and we can find ui. So we are going to do that to say what is 40 cos 30. Okay, so this is 20 root 3. Okay, it's 34.64. So this is 34.64 meters per second. And then 40 sine 30 minus 10. 40. Okay, we don't even need calculator for this. 40 sine 30 is how see we are multiplying 40 by 0 0.5 because sine 30 is 0 0.5. That would be 20. So 20 minus 10 times 1 is 10. So this is 10 meters per second. Such that what we are looking for, our u, is now going to be the square root of ux 34.64 square plus uy 10 square. And from our calculator, we can look at this to say this will be okay. What we just got initially 20 root 3 raised to the power 2. Okay, that's 1200. So we have square root of 1200 plus 10 raised to the power 2 is 100. So we have u to be square root of 1002 plus 100 is 1300. So that the u that we are asked to find the velocity after one second will be square root of 1300 okay so that will be 10 root 13 or 36.055 or 36.06 so this will be 36.06 meters per second as the velocity attained after one second of launch all right here we have the circuit diagram that is a simple rectifier circuit and we are to use it to answer the questions that follow. So these are the questions. In the first case, we are to state the function of each of the parts labeled A. This is A and B. Okay, that is fine and good. We are to sketch the actual signal produced. Let's just look at this holistically. Normally, this is a transformer. That A is a transformer. And ideally, it's a step-down transformer that is actually used to get the source voltage for this. This is a diode just as well as this is another diode, okay? Now, B is a smoothing capacitor. This B is a smoothing capacitor because it's going to smoothen the output that is going to be gotten from this circuit. And this, this is the load that's going to be supplied with the smoothing voltage from the circuit. So, in the first case, that we are asked to actually state the functions of those devices as shown what is transformer going to do and what is the smoothing capacitor going to do okay. now a is the one that produces the alternating current because you can see is a transformer normally it's a step down because it will have some other source of voltage okay but b is the one that smoothens since we are talking about an alternating current so it's going to smoothen the rectified current that is coming from that transformer and ideally this in blue is going to be your source voltage okay but that is going to be at this point a where this voltage will be still sinusoidal but when it gets to b b is going to effect on it in such a way that that solid sinusoid is going to be reduced to this and i want you to note something just notice something here there is a crest and there is a trough this particular region is actually the region in which the capacitor, this smoothing capacitor, it is charging here. Okay. Whereas in this particular region, this is the region where it is discharging. And that is how it actually functions as a smoothener of that particular current of voltage that's going to be produced in the circuit. So that is that with respect to this question. In this question, we are to explain the wave-particle duality of light. And looking at the second question, we are given that the particle of wavelength 4.2 exponent minus 11 meters travels with the momentum of 1.6 exponent minus 23 kilogram meter per second. We are to determine 
the value of the plant's constant. So, whenever we are talking about the wave particle duality of life, is is actually indicating the fact that light can act as a particle, as typified by way of photon, and also as waves, but it cannot act as both a particle and wave at the same time. It's either acting as a particle or is acting as wave per time. And it is attribute to act as a particle that is warranting this second question in which we are asked to find plant's content given the momentum and the wavelength of a particle of light. Now, the formula that we need to use is that the momentum is equal to the plant's constant divided by the wavelength, okay? Such that if we cross multiply, the plant's constant is going to be momentum multiplied by wavelength. So, this is the formula that we need to use. And if we want to make use of that, we just know that plant's constant h will be what the momentum that we are giving here 1.6 times 10 raised to the power minus 23 kilogram meter per second multiplied by the wavelength that was given as 4.2 times 10 raised to the power minus 11 meters. So we can take our calculator to just multiply this out. So this is 1.6 exponent minus 23 multiplied by 4.2 exponent minus 11. Okay. So this is 6.72 exponent minus 34. So this is nothing but 6.72 exponent minus 34. And what's going to be the unit for the plant's constant? That's going to be joules seconds. Okay. So it's just for us to know this particular formula, apply it, and in this particular question, we'll be done and dusted, and our answer will be this quite close to the constant value for the plant's constant, but, but no problem, since the axis were good and fine, just like this. Here, we are being asked to state three observable phenomena where particles behave like waves. Students, I need you to be careful here. They are only asking you to state, so don't waste your time trying to define, trying to enumerate on it because time will not be a friend. So, some of those phenomena where a particle can behave like waves include the fact that it can be diffracted, it can experience interference, polarization can occur, it can be refracted, and it can be reflected. Any theory among these five will be sufficient to earn your full marks in this place and since you're only asked to state, that will be good and fine, all right? So that means you just take this as a bonus question and you'll be good and fine. Here in this question, we're to state the scientific principle underlying the operation of fiber optics. And we're also to explain the terms core and cladding as used in fiber optics. Now, a picture is worth a thousand words and here, the scientific principle behind the operation of fibotics is total internal reflection and it operates in such a way that normally the core is having a higher refractive index more than the cladding. The cladding is the protective sheet on top of the core even though they still have some better protective layer covering both of them. But so that the rays of light that is coming into the core that is the carrying medium should be able to be reflected back inside and not be lost to the cladding. That is why the cladding needs to be of a lower refractive index. And of course, this is just the operation of total internal reflection. And then the core is the central part here shown in white that is acting as a light carrying portion of the fiber optics. Whereas the cladding is the outer layer that surrounds the core and it has a lower refractive index. And if you can explain successfully like this, your full mark is assured and you'll be on your way to excellence. Alright. So here in this question, we're asked to take Hooke's law and as simple as it gets, Hooke's law states that the extension produced in an elastic material is directly proportional to the applied force provided that the elastic limit is not exceeded. Once we are done with that, we are going to be applying that Hooke's law to this particular question in which we are told that a spring has a length of 0.2 meters when a mass of 0.3 kilogram hangs on it and the length of 0.75 meters when a mass of 1.95 kilogram hangs on it. Our mandate is to calculate 
the first constant of the spring and length of the spring when it is unloaded. So we need to note that information that we are being given. It is when the spring is unloaded that we are to find the length of the spring. So this is actually a pictorial view of what we have here. That in the first case, when the mass is 0.3 kilograms, we have 0.2 meters as the length of the spring. Notice that that length will be the addition of the original length L0 plus the extension E1. I'm calling it E1 because we have two cases. So here, this will be 1 and here, this will be 2. In the second case, we are told that it has a length of 0.75 meters, which is, the, which is going to be the addition of the original length plus the second extension when a mass of 1.95 kilogram hangs on it. So we are to calculate the first constant of the spring and the length of the spring when it is unloaded. For us to solve this, we can make use of Hooke's law and the formula that says that force is equal to the force constant multiplied by the extension as a means of solving this question. But looking at the parameters that we have, in the first case, we are given the force mass M1 to be 0.3 kilograms. But we are talking about forces, so we can say F1 is M1 multiplied by G. So that will be 0.3 multiplied by 10 meters per second, and that will be nothing but 3 newtons. Okay. Then M2 we are given as 1.95 kilograms. And again, in the same vein, F2 will be M2, which is 1.95 multiplied by 10. So this will be 19.5 newtons. Okay. The new length we have been given in meters, so we are good and fine to use it. So if you want to employ the formula F is equal to K multiplied by E, in the first case, we can say that for F1, we are going to have 3 is equal to K, which we don't know, multiplied by the extension. Now, this is where it gets tricky. What is the extension in this particular case? We know that the original length L0 plus the extension will give us the length of the spring. So the extension will be the length of the spring minus the original extension. Students, once we miss that point, you are going to get a wrong answer. But the right thing will be that this 0.2 meters is the addition of the original length L0 plus the extension, so that the extension will be 0.2 meters minus L0. So we have 0.2 minus L0. Okay, I can take this as my equation 1. And then the second case, the force is now 19.5 is equal to K into what is the length here is 0.75. Just coming from the explanation I did before that, that length is the addition of the original length plus the extension. So extension will be 0.75 minus L0. So this will be minus L0 also. So this we can call equation 2. So... Our mandate is now to go ahead to solve this question by whatever means we think will be appropriate and get the solution out. But now, this is what you need to notice, students. First, we have to get the first constant of the spring. So, we should eliminate L0 as much as possible. And, okay, if you just want to do that, we can say from equation 1, from 1, we can see that 3 over K is equal to 0.2 minus L0, such that L0 will be this going to the other side, that going to the other side, 0.2 minus 3 over K. So this we can use in the other equation, we can use it in two, that 19.5 is equal to K multiplied by 0.75 minus, instead of L0, now we can put all of this, 0.2, let me put that in brackets, because we have minus 3 over k okay so if you open all that bracket you can have 19.5 is equal to 0.75 k yeah minus 0.2 k when this minus and this minus when they multiply it become plus k multiplied by 3 over k the k will cancel out so we have plus 3 so here if you just collect like that you can have um 19.5 minus 3 is equal to 0.75 k minus 0.2 k and that's going to be 0.55 k okay so 19.5 minus 3 this is going to be 16.5 is equal to 0.55 k and for us to get k we can divide both sides by 0.55 k and this you can take with our calculator 
and 16.5 divided by 0 0.55 what's that going to give us wow 30 so here this is cutting out so that the first constant k is nothing but 30 now what is going to be the unit of k originally we have been told that f is equal to k e so k will be f over e and that will be that the unit will be newtons per meter because force is in newton and e the extension is in meter so this is the value of the constant okay now in the second case we are asked to find the length of the spring when it is unloaded let me just move my body a bit so that I have space to work okay in our first equation we are talking about the fact that the force which was three newtons is equal to the force constant k multiplied by the length 0 0.2 minus the original length l naught now since we have been able to find the value of k that means we can just say that 3 is equal to k is 30 multiplied by 0 0.2 minus that original length when the spring is not loaded so we can just divide by 30 so that 3 over 30 that will be 1 over 10 which is 0 0.1 is equal to 0 0.2 minus l naught so that our l naught will be 0 0.2 minus 0 0.1 and that will be 0 0.1 so, for this particular question, we've been able to get the value of the force constant k to be 30 newtons per meter and the length of the spring when it is not loaded, when there's no force acting on it to be 0 0.1 meters. And it's a very good application of Hooke's law, which we have been able to solve appropriately in this question. Now, here yeah, in this question, talking about diffusion, we are to define what diffusion is. And state factors that affect the rate of diffusion of a substance, and then state the exact relationship between the rate of diffusion of a gas and its density. And just as being shown on the board, in the first case, diffusion is the intimate mixing of substances due to random motion of their molecules or particles. So when you are talking about, for example, the part that somebody fats, okay, so what is happening is diffusion is occurring due to the random motion of the molecules or the particles. So it's just mixing with the atmosphere and then we are getting to perceive it, okay? Then the factors that affect the rate of diffusion include the temperature of the environment, the medium of diffusion, it can be liquid or gas, okay? The density of the substance and the concentration gradient of the particular substance. And here now, in this particular third question, we are asked to state there is a relationship between the rate of diffusion of a gas and its density. The rate of diffusion of a gas is related to its density. You know, from this second one, we're already saying that the factors that affect the rate include even the density of the substance. But the particular relationship will be that the rate of diffusion is equal to 1 over the square root of the density of the gas in question. Okay? So, this is the exact relationship between them. And once you're able to state that, you'll be good and fine, and your full mark will be awarded as appropriate here yeah, in this question on satellite we are told that the satellite of mass m orbits the earth which is of mass capital m with a velocity v at a distance r from the center of the heart our mandate is to derive the relationship between the period t of orbit and the radius r as given now if you want to just notice all the parameters that we are given we are told that the satellite here is of mass small m, the heart is of mass capital M, and then there is a distance between them which is R, and then that satellite is moving with a velocity V. Okay, very good with all these parameters that we are given. And for us to drive this relationship between the period of orbit T, which will be the time it will take for it to complete a circle, okay, and the radius R, which is the distance between the satellite and the center of the heart. We need to consider the fact that the, the centripetal force on this satellite, which is causing it to accelerate, is going to be equal to the gravitational force on the satellite. So, we can just say we are having Fc is equal to Fg. And now, what is Fc originally? Fc is giving us m multiplied by the square of v over the radius, whereas Fg is giving us the gravitational constant multiplied by the product of the masses over the square of the distance between them so 
this what will help us to actually solve this question but we are having velocity here velocity itself is distance over time and for this particular satellite that is orbiting around the earth the distance will be the circumference of that particular orbit which is 2 pi r and then the time will be the period that we are looking at okay so if you want to use this and put it into this particular equation all we are going to have is that we are going to have m over r multiplied by v square will now be 2 pi r over t raised to power 2 that is equal to g multiplied by m multiplied by capital m over r raised to power 2 we can open up this bracket to say this is going to be m over r multiplied by 4 pi square r square over t square which is equal to g multiplied by m and capital m over r square okay i can see already that this r can cut here so i have one r remaining okay and then if i say i will cross multiply so here if i now say i want to cross multiply and just have a I just have a flat thin solution. I can say I'm having m multiplied by 4 pi r square multiplied by this r in red, then multiplied by this r square is equal to this t square multiplying the other side, t square multiplied by g multiplied by m and multiplied by capital M. And of course, m is also common to both sides. I can cut out this. Then I will have, okay, if I want to just take t as a standalone i can have t square to be equal to this r multiplied by r square will be half to this so i have four pi square r raised to power three over this g m okay so this is as good as it gets i can take the whole of all this as a constant okay or i can even just express it out that this is equal to 4 pi square over gm since i'm looking for the relationship between t and r then multiply by r q either i take this as a constant or not i can say t is going to be the square root of all of that expression 4 pi square over gm multiplied by r raised to the power 3 and now 4 the square root of 4 is 2 the square root of pi square is pi so I still have, okay, this is remaining r raised to power 3 over g multiplied by m. So I can only say this is my relationship between t and r, or I can even just actually say that all of these are constant. For t and r, I can have it that t is proportional to the root of r cube if I'm taking every other thing as constant of proportionality because pile we can get g is a constant the mass of the heart is also a constant so either of the two is good and fine and we have been able to drive the relationship between the period t of orbit and r with the case scenario that was depicted for us our question is going to focus on optics and in the very first question we are asked to define the following terms as it relates to converging lines so let's note we are talking about lengths but particularly we are even talking about the converging line. So we want to talk about the focal length and we want to talk about the optical center. So the focal length is the distance between the optical center and principal focus. So this is the principal focus and the optical center is just the center of this lens here, the one crossing both the broken lines and this particular black lines, which is the principal axis. The optical center itself is the geometric center of the lens, just as I'm saying now. This is the geometric center of the lens through which rays of light are going to pass undeviated is a point in the lens through which the principal has this the principal has this here in black it passes and light rays also pass through it undeviated so let's use an example to explain all this grammar that we have just talked about as regard the optical center in particular so our definition had helped us to define this point as the optical center and the distance between the principal focus and the optical center as the focal length but to actually get a full picture of how this is working let's consider this and want to try and place it on the converging lens so there are rules that guide the construction of rays of light that will help us to get the image of such an object like this okay 
So it is the object, and then for us to form the image of this particular object from the converging lens, normally rays of light that will be coming from the object will be drawn parallel to the principal axis. This is the principal axis in black. So rays of light will come, and then when it gets to the lens, it will be refracted through the principal focus. Okay. So since it's coming from this side, then it will be refracted through the principal focus on this particular side and we have noted that the distance between the principal focus and the optical center is a focal length okay then that being as it may be the other rule is that the rays of light coming from the object will pass through the optical center undeviated so from here it will just pass through the optical center and everything and the intersection of those rays of light is going to inform us about where the image is going to be placed. So if you want to have a pictorial view of what I just explained, it's just here. So you can see from the object, for us to get the image, we have rays of light parallel to the principal axis, but when it gets to the lens, it will be refracted through the principal focus here. And then rays of light also coming from the object will pass through the optical center on deviated. So you can see this one is just passing through straight. It's not deviated, it's not refracted at all. And then the point where those rays of light, where they are meeting, is where we are going to have our image. The other rule is that if the rays of light is also passing through the principal focus, once it gets to the lens, it will be refracted and then it will deviate parallel to the principal axis. So it's like the reverse of the one coming parallel to the principal axis that will be refracted through the principal focus. But even if it's coming from the principal focus, once it gets to the lens, it will be refracted to run parallel to the principal axis. So I took my time to explain this because our next question is going to actually leverage on the understanding of how these rays of light, how they emanate from the object to give the image. And we can go ahead to see that right about now. Okay. So yeah, in this question, we have to draw a ray diagram to illustrate how a converging lens is used to produce a virtual image of an object. And we want to leverage on the understanding that we just shared from the previous question. We can have our converging lens as shown. We have its principal focus, center of curvature, and co. We have the principal as this. We are looking for a position, a point where we can place an image in such a way that the object that will be formed is going to be virtual. Virtual in this case, we mean that it has to be on the side where the image is also placed. Okay, so that's going to be our information on the virtuality of the image that we produce. And this is going to be what we are going to experience. And I'm going to just render some explanation here this in solid green is our object and this in light green is our image and coming from the understanding of how rays of light produce the image first we are saying that the ray of light emanating from the image which is parallel to the principal as is this one that i'm showing with this arrow then after passing through the lens it will be refracted to pass through the principal focus so we have something like this okay and then the other one is that those rays of light will pass through the center of curvature undeviated. So we have a particular ray of light coming in this direction. But if you notice this, this is going to be ever expanding. So the image is not going to be formed on this side because those rays of light, they are not going to cross, they are not going to intercept on that particular side. So for us to get it, we need to trace back. And that is where the virtuality of the image of this object is coming in. We are tracing back and we are seeing that here at this particular point, the image is going to be formed because those rays of light are going to intercept there and then this is a virtual image and the other properties is that yes it is virtual it is erect you can see it's erect and then it is magnified it is bigger than this particular object size so if you want to look at it and want to say that okay from this diagram we can see that if you want to consider the image distance the focal length and the object distance we can notice notice that from here to here this is the image distance u then from the principal focus to the center of curvature we have this as our f but look at here so if we look at that and we consider it to the center of curvature we can see that this is our v which is the object distance and the peculiar thing here is that the image distance is less than the focal length which is less than the object distance and with this we are going to have a virtual image of the object which is going to be magnified and erect so as a rule of thumb objects that are placed between the principal focus and the center of curvature 
of a converging lens is going to give us this type of image that is virtual, erect, and magnified. So, students, as you can just you can just um, get your hands dirty by practicing with placement of objects on various locations across the lens. Maybe before um, two multiply by the focal length before two f, maybe around here before two f, you can consider how that image will be formed. You can consider at two f where the image will be formed. You can consider between 2f and f where the image will be formed. Yeah, you can also consider at f at the focal length where will the image where will it be formed. And here we are seeing that between the focal length and the center of curvature, the image produced will have this attribute. So if you have been able to get this, then you have answered this question correctly and dusted it appropriately. So here in this question, we are asked to name the primary colors of light. And then subsequently, we have to match each primary color to its corresponding complementary color. As good as it gets in a pictorial form, these are the primary colors of light, in which we are having those primary colors to be RGB, indicating red, green, and blue. And the complementary colors for red, the complementary is cyan, the complementary for green is magenta, the complementary for blue is yellow. I want you to note just some few things here. Ideally, if you are answering your questions first, Answer the first one, B1, red, green, and blue, and then B2, you rewrite red, green, and blue, and then match it that red, cyan is a complementary for red, magenta for green, and yellow for blue. I just want you to notice this particular thing. Look at this. Red is having its complementary as cyan, okay? Green is having its complementary as magenta. Yellow is having its complementary as blue. And now, the combination of the three is what is actually going to give us the white light. So, you can use this for the additive or the subtractive guide for colors but as requesting the but as regarding the question that was asked the primary colors are rgb the complementary colors are cyan magenta and yellow all right this is quite an interesting question that students if you can get the hang of it you'll be able to solve it subsequently if you, if you come across it in your exams we are told that the ray of light passes symmetrically through a glass prism of angle 60 degrees and refractive index of 1.5. Our mandate is to calculate the angle of incidence and the angle of minimum deviation. So, you can take this as a pictorial view of the glass prism that we are looking at and the included angles are also as shown. Okay, So, here we can just try and look at how to solve this question with the information that we are giving. First and foremost, we know that the refractive index N is giving us sign i the sign of the angle of incidence over sign r the sign of the angle of refraction yeah refraction for the triangular prism but look at the information that we're giving we are told that the triangular prism is of angle 60 degrees so we can say this angles in blue is 60 but permit me to call it and target as a and in other cases i can just write that yes we know that our a is 60 and a is 60 here, right but we need to find the angle of incidence just given the angle a to be 60 and we need to find the means of reflecting how the angle of incidence can be obtained from a and then how we can also find the angle of minimum deviation now let's look at the angle of minimum deviation and how we can solve that holistically if we take this as the incidence ray so this is the incident ray normal to the prism it will make an angle of incidence i okay and then passing through the prism it will make an angle of refraction r but in this special case we are told that the light ray is passing symmetrically through the prism meaning that the angle of refraction at one side of the prism is also going to be the exit angle at the other side of the prism and then we can have the images angle here as e okay so that being said Assuming that the light ray is just passing normally, it will go straight and continue with this broken line. And now if we look at the emergent ray, you can see that there is an angle that the emergent ray is making with the original incident ray. And that angle there, for this particular case, is the angle of minimum deviation. Minimum because it is passing symmetrically. If it's not passing symmetrically, it will just be an angle of deviation. But it is as a means of it passing through symmetrically that we are going to have minimum deviation so we can call this dm and our mandate is to find the angle of incidence i this i and the angle of minimum deviation dm 
So with the parameters that we are given here, let's try and see if we can get um, DM and A as a reason of the angle 60 degrees of the prism that we are given. We will come to make use of our laws of geometry coming from mathematics and that will be good and fine. If I call this M, N, O and P, if you consider the quadrilateral M and O P, you can see that this angle here at P, this is also a right angle, at 10, this is also a right angle. So we can say that angle A plus 90 degrees at N plus this angle here, okay, if I call that, let's say I can call that X, I'll just know that as X, okay, plus angle X plus the other 90 degree that is at P, call that another 90, that is equal to 360 degrees as the sum of angles of a quadrilateral, 180 into N minus 2, okay, and of course it's just four sided, just like a rectangle. So A is the angle of the prism that we're given at 60 degrees, so X in that particular case will be 360 minus the sum of 90 and another 90 and another 60, okay. So that X is going to give us 90 plus 90 is 180, 180 plus 60 is 240, 360 minus 240, that is 120 degrees. But this angle here, this angle in green, this angle in green, if I call that Y, okay, you know, initially I'm calling this X, if I call this angle in green, if I call it Y, we can see that Y and S are angles on the straight line, so X plus Y is 180 degrees, because the angles on the straight line, so that Y will be 180 minus X, and that X is 120 degrees okay so y itself is 60 degrees which inherently is also a so this y this place is also a and that is 60 degrees now i'm just trying to find a means of getting the angle of refraction here r and then maybe later i can also come to get the angle of incidence i now for us to get r we can see that this a is exterior to this triangle in which you have the base angles to be r and r and from trigonometry we know that a is going to be the sum of the two opposite interior angles of the triangle. So A is R plus R, which is 2R. And then I can say R is A, which is 60 over 2. So the angle of refraction we are saying to be A over 2. We will note that, okay? So this is our very first postulate. On the second note, we can look at this angle high. And then if I call this angle here, if I call this theta, this angle is also theta as a reason of the symmetry of this diagram. And this angle of incidence I and this particular angle, theta plus R, they are vertically opposite angles. So I can say I is nothing but theta plus R, okay? And then, as interesting as that gets, already, of course, we have R to be A over 2. How do we get theta as a reason of this angle of non deviation? Looking at that triangle also, we are seeing that the angle of minimum deviation is exterior to these two theta, this theta and this theta. So we can say that actually dm is equal to theta plus theta, which is two theta, so that theta is also dm over two. So with the value of theta as dm over two and r as a over two, we can say our angle of incidence is also equal to Theta is dm over 2 plus r is a over 2 so that i itself is dm plus a over 2. So we have two values here, the angle of refraction as a over 2 and the angle of incidence as dm plus a over 2. So instead of just writing n to the sine i over sine r, I can say n inherently will be sine of i, that is now dm plus a over 2 divided by r divided by sine r which will be sine a over 2 so this is the formula for the refractive index that will help us to solve this question holistically okay we are gotten our a to be 60 okay so for this particular question we are now looking for i okay and we are looking for the m so this our two unknowns and to solve in the first question to find the angle of incidence we'll still come back to this formula for refractive index to say that 1.5 is equal to 
sine i which you are looking for divided by sine r now sine r will be sine a over 2 so we have this as sine 60 over 2 sine 60 over 2 is sine 30 so we can say sine i is equal to 1.5 multiplied by sine 30 and sine 30 itself is 0 0.5 0 0.5 times 1.5 is 0 0.75 so that i will be arc sine 0 0.75 and we have to check that in our calculator we have arc sine 0 0.75 that is equal to 48.59 we can say 48.6 we can say i is 48.6 degrees so our first solution is out and that is as good as it gets we we'll now try and find the means to look for the angle of minimum deviation all right so in the second case, we can say that to get the angle of minimum deviation, our hand, which is 1.5, we now want to use this formula holistically, okay? Is equal to the sine of that angle of minimum deviation plus A. A we have been given to be 60 over 2 divided by sine A over 2, which is sine 30. Sine 30 is 0 0.5. 0 0.5 times 1.5 is 0.75. So that means sine DM plus 60 over 2 is equal to 0 0.75 or we can even say dm plus 60 over 2 will be arc sine 0 0.75 so let me just do that that what we're having is dm plus 60 will be arc sine 0 0.75 okay and what is arc sine 0 0.75 that's the answer that we just got 48.59 so i can say 1 over 2 of dm plus 60 is 48 point is 48.6 such that dm plus 60 itself will be 2 times 48.6 and 2 times 48.6 this will be 97.2 and then dm will be 97.2 minus 60 degrees and that will be 37.2 Decrease as the angle of minimum deviation, whereas we have gotten our angle of incidence to be 48.6, and then we would have covered this question listically, and that is the solution that is expected of us. So, generally, this is the, this is the formula that students are expected to use. This is the formula that you are expected to use. I just took this time out to explain it so that even if you get to meet it subsequently in your exams, you can just make use of the formula directly, having the understanding of how it was obtained so that you are not confused at all. It's still in line with the formula for refractive index that we have as sine i over sine r. All right. This question is outrightly focused on electricity in physics. And in the first case, by being asked what is the root mean square of an AC, we're also asked to define the impedance of an AC circuit. Now, a picture for me is always worth a thousand words. And in the first case, to define the root mean square of an AC, we need to look at a DC. So this is a direct current, you can see. This is denoting battery cells, okay? And then the current that we will have in a DC circuit that will produce the same heating effect as the current in an AC is what is regarded to as the root mean square current. And it's defined, you know, normally for the alternating current, the current will also be sinusoidal just like this. And this is what we are going to have. But the root mean square is defined as the peak current here, the peak, the peak here, if this is I, if this is I, the peak here, IP, okay, divided by its square root of 2. That is the definition of the root mean square current in an AC, okay? Now, in the second case, when we are talking about an impedance in an alternating current circuit, normally we need to understand the features of an alternating current circuit. That is a circuit that has at least two of a resistor, a capacitor, and an inductor, okay? So it will have at least two of these three devices. And then the impedance will be the total opposition to the flow of current in that particular circuit. In a normal circuit, we just have the resistance as the opposer to the flow of current. But now, in an AC, we have the resistive load, the capacitive load, and the inductive load. And the combination of the three is what is tagged the impedance. So, so that is the example of the definition of all this. And if you want to put it in words, is just as given here that the root mean square is just the value of the steady or direct current which will dissipate it at the same rate with that current 
in a given resistance. It is the square root of the mean value of the squares of the current or voltage because they didn't specifically tell us current or voltage here. So it can be current or voltage and that is taking over a whole circuit. Now in the case of impedance, it is the total position to the flow of an AC by both resistive and reactive component as I showed in the diagram the other time. So it is the total opposition of a circuit which can consist of any two of the resistor, the inductor or the capacitor. So that will now receive the flow of AC in the circuit. That is what constitutes the impedance, okay? Here in this question, we are being told that an electrical device rated 120 volts and 60 watts here, as shown in the diagram, is operated on a 240 volt 50 hertz main supply, which is also as shown here. Now, the circuit has a capacitor connected in series with the electrical device and the supply. So that is why we have our capacitor as shown here. And our mandate is to calculate the capacitance of the capacitor. So let's start with the mandate before us. We are asked to find the capacitance of the capacitor. Now, looking at the particular circuit that we have here, we know that since it's a series circuit, the same current will flow in that circuit. So the current flowing across the capacitor is also going to be the value of the current flowing across the resistive load. And since that is the case, we can say that the voltage across the capacitor will be the current flowing in the circuit multiplied by the capacitive reactance. Now, if we can get the value of the current and we can get the value of the voltage across the capacitor, we can get the reactance of the capacitor and then we know that that reactance SC is actually 1 over 2 pile FC where pile was given as 3.142 F is the frequency of the circuit given as 50 hertz and C is that capacitance of the capacitor that we are looking for so we can just do a change of subject of formula to say that our SC will be 1 over 2 pile F XC so let's just take it piecewise okay first how do we get the current flowing in this particular circuit since we have this as a resistive load and we are giving the voltage across this as 120 volts and the power given as 60 watts we know that from physics power in this particular case that we even have a resistive load is given as a product of the current multiplied by the voltage now we are giving the power to be 60 the voltage to be 120 then i will be the power over the voltage and that will be amounting to 60 watts divided by 120 volts so the current in this particular circuit as deduced from the resistive load is nothing but 0 0.5 amperes so that is good and fine since we have the current now we can proceed to try and find voltage drop across that particular capacitor and for us to get that we can make use of the fact that the square of the voltage flowing in the circuit is going to be the square of the voltage across the capacitor plus the square of the voltage across the resistive load. So, since we now have the voltage across the capacitor as what we are looking for, we can now say that V square, Vc square is equal to V square minus Vr square. So, let's just put in those values there. This will now be what is the source voltage? That is 240. So, we have 240 raised to power 2 minus what is the voltage? Of the resistive load that is 120 so we have 120 over 2 raised to the power 2 so if you want to use our calculator we have 240 raised to the power 2 minus 120 raised to the power 2 that is 43,200 so this is 43,200 such that the voltage across the capacitor itself is going to be the square root of 43,200 okay so we can just say the square root of our answer 207.85 so this is 207.85 volts so these are as interesting as it gets now since we have now gotten vc and we have gotten the high from this particular formula here we can now say that our vc over i is going to be instead of using xc we can use this for our hex one over 2 by F multiplied by the capacitance of that capacitor. So that's what we're going to do now, and we'll get our capacitance out and fine. But I'll need to clear my board first, okay? So those are the values that we have gotten so far. But we are made to understand that here, yeah, we want to 
make SC dissolve the formula, it will be VC over I is equal to SC, and SC itself is 1 over 2 pi FC, 1 over 2 pi FC. Now, I love to just make my unknown dissolve the formula, so if I cross multiply here, I can say that means that the capacitance of the capacitor is going to be I times 1, that is I, divided by 2 pi F times VC, that is 2 pi F multiplied by VC. So, all I need to put in is all these parameters to say what is the current that was given as 0.5 amperes as calculated before. Then, 2 times pi was given as 3.142. The frequency we were given originally as 50 hertz. Okay, and then the voltage across the capacitor we have obtained to be 207.85 volts. So, a capacitance we can get by evaluating this particular function, and we can use our calculator there to say that we are having 0.5 divided by everything in bracket. So, 2 times 3.142, okay, multiplied by 50 and multiplied by. Now, this was just the answer we got initially, so I can just multiply by my answer, and that is equal to what? This is 7.6563, okay, let me just say 7.66, so this is 7.66 times 10 raised to the power minus 6 farad. Now, 10 raised to the power minus 6 will amount to micro, so this is nothing but C is equal to 7.66. Microfarad as the value of the capacitance of the capacitor in this particular circuit that we are looking at. All right, and here in this question, we are told that the circuit diagram, this circuit diagram, illustrates two capacitors of capacitances C1, C1 here. Let me just identify that C1 here and C2 that are connected in series across a two volt source. So, our mandate first and foremost is to find the expression for the total capacitance. In terms of C2, so C1 is not going to reflect in the equation. We only want to make use of C2, okay? Then we have to get the potential difference across each, each, across each one of them, across each capacitor. No problem, good and fine. In the first case, for us to find an expression for the total capacitance in terms of C2, let's even leave in terms of C2 first. Let's look at, in series, how do we find the total capacitance of capacitors connected in series? Is given as 1 over C total is equal to 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2. Okay, so if you want to do that, we can just say we can find the LCM that 1 over C total is going to be that's going to be C1, C2, and then C1, C2 over C1 will remain C2, so we have C2. C1, C2 over C2 remains C1, so C1 times 1 we have C1. So here we can just Say we want to cross multiply to say that the total capacitance in this case is going to be C1 divided by C2 over the sum of C1 and C2. I just took my time to get this out. Ideally, this should just be on the fly that you'll be able to get straight and direct. So, this is the first thing we need to note. But we have to obtain the total capacitance in terms of C2. And then this is where it gets interesting. Look at this. We have C1. And we have the distance relating it. We have C2. We have the distance relating it. Okay. Normally, we are made to understand that the capacitance is inversely proportional to the distance between the electric plates. So, in this particular case, you can say C1 is inversely proportional to 1 over 2. And then C2 is inversely proportional to 1 over 5. Where 2 millimeters and 5 millimeters at the distance between the plate of the two capacitance. Okay? So, now, these two, we can just say we want to bring them together to say we have, um, let's say, C1 over C2. That will be 1 over 2 divided by 1 over 5. So, for this now, we can say we want to cross multiply such that we are going to have um, 1 over 2 C2 is equal to 1 over 5 C1. But we're asked to find it in terms of C2. So, C1 is not going to reflect at all. So, from here, we can say C1 is going to be 5 over 2 of C2. I just cross multiply the fractions in front of the 2. So, 5, we're going to multiply the numerator here as 5 over 2 C2. 
That means I cannot make use of this particular expression for C1 in this formula for C total that I've gotten initially. And then I would have been able to find an expression for the total capacitance in terms of C2. Student, I hope you understand this. You already know the concept of finding the total capacitance for a circuit in series, okay? We just brought in this idea of the fact that the capacitance is inversely proportional to the distance between the dielectric plate of a capacitor. And then, if you can do that for C1, we can also do it for C2. And since we are talking about capacitance, we can bring them as a relation to one another and find C1 in terms of C2. So we are going to just use this now in our formula for total capacitance and will be good and fine. All right. So this is what we have gotten so far. And we want to reflect the total capacitance only in terms of C2. We can just say whatever we see C1, we are going to put 5 over 2 C2. So we can say our C total is going to be, in the first case, C1, that will be 5 over 2 multiplied by C2, again multiplied by another C2, over C1 again, that will be 5 over 2 C2 plus another C2, okay? Okay, so this is going to be 5 over 2 multiplied by C2 square divided by here. If I bring in, if I want to solve this, as if I can say for this second C2, I have it as 2 over 2. So 5 plus 2 is 7, 2 is the same base, so I can just have it as 7 over 2. I hope you get that student. I'm just doing the LCM straight and trying to express it out. So this will just be 7 over 2 C2. So I can just write it straight as 7 over 2 C2. And of course, we have C2 square up and we have C2 down. This is C2 here can go on here. We have it as just C2. So our C total is going to be 5 over 2 C2 divided by 7 over 2. So this is going to be 5 over 2. Instead of divided, I can say times 2 over 7 of C2. And of course, if I am to cut, 2 here can cut 2. So this is going to be 5 over 7 C2 as the total capacitance of this particular circuit in terms of C2. All right? Now, for us to calculate the potential difference across each capacitor, we have already obtained the total capacitance to be 5 over 7 of C2. But by reason of our understanding of charges, you know that charge is the total capacitance multiplied by the voltage. So we can say that total charge Q is nothing but that total capacitance, which is 5 over 7 divided by C2, multiplied by the voltage. And the voltage here we can see was given as 2 volts, so we can say multiplied by 2. So this is nothing but 10 over 7 C2, okay? Now, for us to get the charge across each of them, let's take maybe we want to find, since we have C2, let's say we want to find V2, the voltage across the C2, across this particular one, that will just give us the Q, the total Q, over the capacitance of that capacitor C2. So, I'm doing this because I know that that ratio will cut us so that we can have 10 over 7 C2 divided by what is our C2 already. Of course, our C2 is C2. Okay? So, this is just nothing but 10 over 7 volts. Or if you want to write it in the normal voltage, you can just say 10 over 7. What is 10 over 7? 10 divided by 7. That is equal to... 1.4285, I can just 1.43, so this is 1.43 volts, that is V2, but then to get the V1, we know that normally the voltage across the circuit, since it's a series circuit, the voltage through volts will be first the drop across V2, yeah, plus the drop across V1, so it is the sum of these two voltages that we add up to this total voltage through volts, so I can just say since that is the case, then V1 will be the V total, which is 2 volts, minus V2, okay? That is minus V2, and that will be 2 minus 1.43, and 2 minus 1.43 is nothing but 0.57 volts. And that is also consistent with the distance between the plates, that here, since it's an inverse proportion, 
Then, the larger the distance between the plates, the more the voltage that will be dropped across that particular capacitor, and the lower the distance between the plates, the lower the voltage across the capacitor. So, from what we have gotten so far, we've gotten our V2 to be 1.43 volts and V1 to be 0.57 volts. And with that, we've been able to solve this question holistically, and that is done and dusted. So for this question, the principal factor that determines the relative stability of a radioactive nuclide is actually the neutron to proton ratio. So we need to get the number of neutrons, we need to get the number of protons. So we need to get the number of neutrons and we also need to get the number of protons and find the ratio to determine the stability of the radioactive nucleus. So for the second question, which we have a number of radionuclides and we need to determine the stability compared to one another. This is what we are going to take. Let's just take like the first one, for instance, in which you are giving x and we have it as 40 and 20. For this particular case, it would be good to know that this 40 is actually the atomic number and then this 20 is the proton number. So, we need to first and foremost get the neutron number the atomic number is denoted as A and the proton number is denoted as Z. Now, for us to get the proton number, generally we make use of the formula that the atomic number is actually consisting of the proton number Z plus the neutron number N, so that the neutron number can be obtained by saying it is the atomic number minus the proton number. So, so for each of these radionuclides, we need to get the atomic number, the proton number, and the neutron number, and then we can find the neutron to proton ratio. And if you want to do that here, yeah, let me just say we have X, X, 40, 20. We have W, 92, 36. And we have Y, 95, 42. So we want to get the atomic number for each one of them. For X, that is 40. For W, is 92. For Y, that is 95. The proton number, which we can also deduce from the figure that we are giving, we can see that the proton number for Z is 20. The one for W is 36, and then the one for Y is 42. Now, for us to get the neutron number, we need to now subtract the proton number from the atomic number. So, 40 minus 20, this is 20 here. 92 minus 36, that will be 12 minus 6 is 6, remaining 8 minus 20 is 56. And then 95 minus 42, that will be 53. So, we can look at the neutron to proton ratio. In this case, it will be 20 over 20 so this is one that's quite stable okay then in the second case we have 56 divided by 36 and we can use our calculator to obtain that that we have 56 divided by 36 that's giving us 1.555 or we can say 1.6 all right and then 53 divided by 42 what's that going to give us 53 over 42 so this is 1.262 or let's just say 1.26 is 1.26 okay and now looking at those values we can see that the one that is very very stable is x so the order and look at that we are saying that it is decreasing order so the most stable one is actually x 40 20 followed by the next one will be 1.2 you can see 1.6 is quite far from even both of them so the next one will be y which will be 95 42 y okay and then the least stable one is w and we can tag that as 92 36 w so this is the order and the justification that they are asking for is for us to show this neutron proton ratio that we have stated to be the factor that determines the relative stability of a radioactive nucleus. Yeah, we have to explain the term ionization potential. And ionization potential is a minimum energy that is required to remove an electron completely from an atom. Now, the next question is going to be a practical demonstration of that. So, that will serve as our explanation for this definition. Okay. So, this question here is going to perfectly illustrate the explanation that we just made. But I told that the diagram, this diagram, illustrates energy levels in the hydrogen atom. So, E0 
is the energy of the ground state you can see in or corresponding to n is one now when an electron makes a transition from level n is three to level n is one it emits a photon of wavelength 1.02 exponent minus seven meters we are to calculate e norm okay we are to calculate this e norm and then we are to calculate the energy potential of the hydrogen atom we are giving this number of parameters plus constant the speed and then the conversion of one electron volt to joules in the first case the transition from state and the change in energy level is given as hc over lambda and here what is the change in energy level we are having a movement from e3 to e norm okay is equal to hc over lambda so let's just see what we can do here and i'm going to be matriculate about the units so that you can see the appropriate conversion that we need to do energy level for n equals to 3 is minus 1.5 electron volts then minus the energy level of the state that is being transitioned to is going to be h which is Planck's constant 6.6 .6 times 10 raised to power minus 34 joules seconds multiplied by the speed 3 times 10 raised to power 8 meters per seconds and we are using the wavelength to divide that and that wavelength is 1.02 multiplied by 10 raised to power minus 7 meters now let's cut here we are seeing meters and this is also meters they are cutting out we are seeing second and we are seeing per second here so that is also cutting out then that means that what we are going to have on the left hand side we have minus 1.5 electron volts minus e no is equal to let's calculate this with a calculator okay so we are going to have 6.6 .6 exponent minus 34 multiplied by 3 exponent 8 divided by 1.02 exponent minus 7 okay so this is 1.94 exponent minus 18 1.94 exponent minus 18 but what is the unit is going to be joules okay now this is joules but this is electron volt we need to convert this either we convert electron volts to joules or we convert joules to electron volt okay so i want to convert joules to electron volt i'm comfortable with that okay so since one electron volt is 1.6 exponent minus 19 joules i can say here yeah, i can convert this to electron volt by dividing by 1.6 times 10 to power minus 19 joules then multiplying by one electron volt okay so this is what will render me to have this in electron volt so that on the left hand side i can have minus 1.5 electron volt minus e norm is equal to on the right hand side let me obtain that with the calculator the answer we just got divided by 1.6 exponent minus 19 okay not 9 minus 19 that's going to give me 12.13 okay so this is 12.13 electron volt so that if i rearrange take e not to the other side i'm going to have e no is equal to minus 1.5 electron volt minus 12.13 electron volt and that is going to give us minus 13.63 electron volt as the amount of energy that is on level n is equal to one as requested in this particular question so since i've gotten that now i need to know how to find the energy potential of the hydrogen atom and we're already saying that that energy potential is the amount of energy that is required to remove an electron totally from the atom. So you can say in the second case, we are looking at the ionization potential of the hydrogen atom. That ionization potential, the ionization energy or the ionization potential is going to be E at infinity minus E naught. And of course, we just got our e naught now and we have our here at infinity to be zero so that is going to give us zero minus what we got was um, minus 13.63 electron volts okay so the energy potential will be the negative sign will multiply each other to give us plus so we have 13.63 electron volts and that is 13.63 electron volts as the energy potential the energy energy of this particular hydrogen atom.
Here, we are asked to explain the statement, the work function of sodium is 2 electron volts, and then we are told that light of wavelength 116 nanometers is shown on the surface of a sodium metal of work function 2 electron volts. We are to determine whether photoelectrons will be emitted. So here is a pictorial view and the solution to our explanation that first and foremost, the minimum energy needed to remove an electron from the surface of sodium metal is 2 when zero electron volt, that is the explanation of the statement, the work function. So inherently, we are just trying to define the work function, that the work function is the more energy needed to remove an electron from the surface of a metal. In this case, we are saying for sodium is two electron volts. So in our explanation, we need to say that from the surface of sodium metal is two electron volts. And in the second part, that we are being told that light of wavelength 116 nanometers is shown on the surface of a sodium metal. So this is the light in yellow. And the wavelength that we are given is 160 exponent minus 9 meters. Okay, this is not yet the threshold wavelength. Okay, it's just the wavelength that we are given, and we are just trying to find a means to see if that wavelength is actually the threshold wavelength or not. And if it is actually the threshold wavelength, then it will be able to allow electrons to be emitted from the surface of the metal. If not, maybe if it is higher or lower, we are going to get to that we see the impact that is going to have. So fundamentally, we know that the work function, which is defined as phi, is the plus constant multiplied by the threshold frequency. But since we are not given the threshold frequency here, we are not talking about frequency, we are talking about wavelength. So frequency is speed over wavelength. So we have this as hc over the threshold wavelength, okay? Which we need to compare the value of this threshold wavelength to the value of this wavelength that we are giving to know if it will be sufficient to remove the electron from the surface of that sodium metal. Already we have been given the work function as two electron volts, okay? But for the electron volt, we need to convert to joules because that will be the unit that will be consistent with our working. So we can say the work function, which is two electron volts, multiplied by the conversion to joules, we will run that just like we are coming from the previous question, we multiply by 1.6 exponents minus 19 joules, okay, is equal to the plus constant 6.6 .6 exponent minus 34 multiplied by the speed, which is 3 times 10 to the power 8, okay, and we are dividing this by the threshold wavelength, which we are looking for as lambda naught. So, so if you just rearrange lambda naught here, it will be 6.6 .6 exponent minus 34 Multiply by 3 times 10 raised to the power 8, and we are dividing with 2 times 1.6 times 10 raised to the power minus 19. So let's, let's just use our calculator straight here. We have 6.6 .6 exponent minus 34 multiplied by 3 exponent 8. Then divided by, I need to put all of this in brackets so that it will reflect as the whole of my denominator 2 times 1.6 exponent minus 19 okay so what's that going to give me this is 6.1875 6.1875 times 10 raised to power minus 7 and the unit will have to be meters now look at that value look at that value but what we have inherently is that we are giving this as 160 times 10 raised to the power minus 9 meters. If we want to take this to minus 9, then we can shift our decimal place to 1, 2, so that this will become minus 9, and then we'll have it as 618. So let me just write like that. Now what we are going to have is, is 618.75 exponent minus 9. So that is loss of indices coming into play for us. So what we need to now do is to compare these two values. So what we have originally is that the original wavelength that we are giving was 160 nanometers. Okay. And here the wavelength that we got as the fundamental wavelength is 619 nanometers. So looking at this, we can see that the wavelength we got is actually higher than the wavelength that we are giving in the question. And as that is the case, photoelectrons will be emitted from this sodium metal is going to cause photo emission to occur because we can see that here the energy is actually inversely proportional
to the wavelength. And if we put in these values, we will see that the higher the wavelength, the lesser the energy that is going to be supplied. And the lesser the wavelength, the higher the energy that's going to be supplied. So for us to have a case of the threshold wavelength to be 619 nanometers, we can see that our wavelength for this particular case is far lesser than that. And if it is lesser, okay, here yeah, it is lesser, then the energy will be higher. So that energy will be sufficient to remove the electron from the surface of the metal. And since that is the case, you can say for this particular case scenario, there is going to be emission of photoelectron from the surface of the sodium metal. And with that, we've come to the end of this question too. All right. So that's how we are going to be having today. It's been a wonderful journey in which we took our time to demystify all of these 12 questions from the theory paper of the 2021 physics exam paper for school candidates and we believe that these have gone a long way to help you to set you on the right path to excellence don't forget to subscribe to the channel it's due to the academy and until next time god bless you